Hi everyone, my name is Ruby. I just want to welcome you to chapel this morning. Um, as you lean into worship, I hope that you are able to receive God's word. Give 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Hello, it's a, it's a joy to, to be with you today. Thank you for thank you for having me. Today we're going to be looking at James 4, 13 to 17. So let me just read the passage for us. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or to that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, I thank you so much for this timely word. I pray that now as as we feast upon it, as we submit ourselves to your word, that you be pleased to reveal yourself to us. Father, please would you speak to our hearts by the power of your spirit. Make us more like Jesus, Father, as a result of feasting upon your word. For we ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Well, I, I wonder, how would, you, how would you describe your life? If there was one of those, do you have these word clouds, you know, that they're, they're kind of generated and you put in these different words and then depending upon how many times it appears, you know, the big ones kind of stand out in bold, huge font. I, I wonder what the, the big word in that word cloud would be of your life. How would you describe it in a word? Or perhaps if you were writing an academic CV or some kind of spiritual formation review, what words would you use to describe yourself? How would you feel if someone said, oh, I know Rob, he's, he's vapour, <laughs> in a non-threatening kind of way. Or, yes, yes, I do know Sarah, she's a fog. I doubt any of us would immediately think that an excellent qualification for life, leadership, ministry is the recognition that we are missed. Christy Mare, what a missed. It isn't the first thing that I'd want to write down. You know, we'd probably uh, move towards words like confident, capable, competent. And it's into this attitude James speaks. It's not arrogant to call ourselves confident or competent, but when it's divorced from humble dependence upon the Lord, James here is speaking directly into that. It's into this arrogant independence. In the verses leading up to 13 to 17, James shares that the purpose of prayer is for us to align our wills to the Lord's, not vice versa. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so these verses begin with, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. James is directing his attention. He's channeled it directly into the customs of ancient times. The roaring mercantile trade roaming from city to city, from Tyre, Sidon, Caesarea, Crete, Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, Rome. Powerhouses. What cities? We will go. We will go. We'll give it a year and we're going to make a lot of money. We're going to become a success. We will make a profit. Now, this kind of attitude, as I mentioned, it goes beyond making diligent and wise plans for the future. One commentator points out that it's not, let us go, let us go, but we will go. It's in the indicative mood. What presumption! Is the future really in their control? And for that matter, is it really in ours? You do not know what will happen tomorrow, James says. And this past year, well, it's just brought that reality to light quite starkly, hasn't it? In 2019, who of us knew that a devastating global pandemic lay just around the corner? Who of us knew the devastating death toll, the impact this would have upon our personal lives, upon church, upon ministry? 
My diaries change time and time and time again. Who of us can plan with any kind of certainty? Who of us knows what will happen tomorrow? None of us. What is your life? James writes. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then just vanishes. We see the folly of our arrogance, of our plans, when it's decoupled from a right view of self, we are vapour, and from a right view of God, he is sovereignly in control of our lives. You know, as I was reading this passage and preparing for this talk, I was so struck by it, most particularly and especially in light of the release of recent reports of high-level issues of sexual misconduct within the church and certain parachurch ministries and organisations. There's sexual misconduct, toxic fear cultures, celebrity status, the trappings of money, wealth, power, the glitz. When we deceive ourselves, when we deny and when we resist our vapour-like status that we are but the mist, what we do instead is we try to reform it recast it and mould it into something else. We try to form the mist into matter. And it's just like collecting, trying to collect falling snowflakes, isn't it? It's impossible. Even as we try to reach out and hold on to them, they just, they just melt in our hands. We can't, there is nothing tangible there. And so what we do is we try and resist it. We inflate our credentials. We might prioritise public platforms, but have no personal friends. We might talk about the benefit of belonging to a local church family, but not actually be part of one for ourselves. We might talk about acknowledging God, but be accountable to no one. We might think that due to the greatness of our words and plans, we are able, well, we're above the usual temptations of ordinary men and women. We try to form the mist into matter, and by doing so, we say that we matter the most. Or we might see someone else, you know, someone else whose gifting and success just blinds us to their vapour-like status. You know, we might think it's not worth lovingly challenging them because, you know, they do travel from city to city and they, they are such a success. We deny their creaturely status and by doing so we subtly affirm the deceit. They are missed, we are missed and there is nothing that they or we can do to change that. And that's why James says that boasting and arrogance is evil. Arrogance, we know what that is. It's having this overinflated sense of oneself and one's abilities. And James calls it evil. He's choosing his words very carefully. Because who of us has the power to form reality through our words? That's what boasting tries to do. Boasting is evil. It's not only a denial of our creaturely status, because we can't create, only God can, but boasting also creates a gap between reality, what's the reality, and the arrogant, presumptuous illusion that we cast upon the world. When we say, we will go here, this is what we will do, we shall do this, it creates this reality gap. It's about appearances, the spiritual shine, but no substance. It's about success, but no suffering. It's about credentials, but not about character. I wonder, is there a gap for you between appearance and reality? Is there a reality gap? What do we project and where are we actually at with the Lord? This is particularly acute at seminary. I mean, I see this within myself. I lecture at a residential theological college here in the UK. And even seeing people most days, you know, mainly over Zoom now, but don't you just feel that nagging desire to want to show that, that you know more? To prove yourself just a little bit. You know, to justify the bags of money that have been poured out in order for you to be there. You're a leader of tomorrow. You're someone the church has identified and released to grow in your love and understanding of the Lord. And so what happens is ever so slightly feeling that pressure, we might lean towards um, explaining in conversations rather than actually asking questions. You know, we might find ourselves forgetting to pray. After all, we're a little bit above that. You know, you're you're the spiritual elite. We know that we can just blag it through the day anyway. The world isn't going to stop turning if we forget to pray or deliberately refuse to. And so slowly and ever so silently, our hearts 
harden as our perspective is drawn away from humble dependence upon the Lord and towards this haughty independence. Instead, James to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. And doesn't this attitude take us directly into the heart of Jesus's Gethsemane prayer? Lord, not my will be done, but yours. Jesus is the only one who is able to model true, humble dependence upon his heavenly father all the way through death and out the other end. He knew the right thing to do and he didn't fail to do it. I don't know about you, but when I read uh, that verse, verse 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for them is sin, I feel, I feel a slight shiver. James is asking each of us, do your words line up with your works? As James says, you know, you cannot show anyone, show me, show me someone who can show me your faith apart from your works. Now, we aren't justified before God on the basis of what we do, but we are freed to do them. Do your words line up with your works? Does your life express humble dependence upon the Lord? I was recently listening to an interview with a team member from a major ministry who so painfully said and admitted that he should have asked more questions. Uh, He cited James 4 and said, I should have done it. I knew what the right thing to do. I knew what that was and yet I didn't do it and I need to apologise. What is the right thing that you need to do today? Because James is saying that it's so much easier to think about humility or pretend to be humble than to actually live it. If we know what we should do, we are accountable to do them. I wonder where this hits the road for you. And I'm so sorry that I don't I don't know you or love you well enough to be able to share some concrete examples. Um, but here are a couple that have come to come to my mind just by being part of a a seminary here. Uh, I don't know if this is relevant for you, but here are a couple. Are you willing to cite your sources in essays? How do you approach paraphrasing quotes? Do Do you think, well, you know, this'll do, I've changed a word, that's close enough, right? Are you willing to submit to the Lord in this small area, yet really significant area, which will set concrete patterns for the rest of your life in academic life, Or would you rather be the authority in those instances? These are small examples, but they display where our dependence truly lies. Prepare your hearts each day to walk in the sovereign ordering of the Lord, knowing that your life is mist, or it's like dust, or it's like grass, as we're told elsewhere. Don't resist the mist. If we resist it, we try to reform it. And usually that that stems from a deep despair. There's usually this kind of deep existential just angst simmering away beneath the surface. That's when we have to make it about appearances, the spiritual shine. It's about the spiritual shine, but it has no substance. It's about success, but not suffering. It's about credentials and not character. If that's you, and you're finding yourself resisting the mist, as it were, please may I encourage you to speak with someone. Don't resist the mist, but do allow scripture to form a right view of yourself so that God can become more to you. He guides and directs misty lives, which are here today and gone tomorrow. They vanish just like that. He sees all, and yet he's so intimately involved in and invested in your flourishing. Having gone through the cross, the risen Lord Jesus will not forget you now. Lean not upon your own purposes, but the Lord's. Perhaps you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, that's me. I know that I'm like mist, I'm like vapour, that my days are like the grass. I'm acutely aware of it. If that's you, may I remind you of the confidence that we can have in the Lord. You know, while our lives are but mist or like grass, his isn't. God never changes. And you can have extreme confidence and security in the sovereign ordering of each one of your days that is written in his book. Don't form the mist into matter yourself. Only Jesus makes mist matter. Spurgeon, he wrote this on uh, this section in James, said, note that contrast, note it always, observe how weak we are, how strong he is, how proud we are, 
how condescending he is, how erring we are, and how infallible he is, how changing we are, and how immutable he is, how provoking we are, and how forgiving he is. Observe how in us there is only ill, and how in him there is only good. Yet our ill but draws forth his goodness, and still he blesseth. Oh, what a rich contrast. Our fragility, our mistiness, our ill, but draws forth God's goodness. Our need draws Jesus to us, not further away from us. Don't resist the mist. Let it draw Jesus' goodness and blessing to you. Or perhaps you're hearing this and you're thinking, well, sure, but it's good to make plans. It's good to reach for more, to demonstrate godly ambition. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this isn't about exercising wisdom as we make future plans, but it's about the folly of being right in our own eyes. Or, you know, of saying after the pandemic, for example, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and it's going to be great. I wonder what those things are for you. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? We plan in our hearts, but it's the Lord who establishes our footsteps. May I remind you to ensure what you say and what you do line up. If you know the good and do not do it, it's mere pretense, illusion, and that is evil. And what is evil other than privation or deconstruction of the good or a removal of it? It's chaotic, it's paper thin, it's actually parasitic. Evil is chaotic and gratuitous, whereas God's actions are orderly and they're teleological. Boasting leads to nothing but hot air. It rises, and as it does, it can separate us from truth, from reality. What is the end of boasting? The telos, the end of boasting, is in the boaster, isn't it? It serves to inflate the one boasting. The teleological end, the purpose of boasting, is in the person who boasts. They direct praise and attention to themselves and communicate that they are in control of their lives and their outcomes. It's evil because it's disordered as it doesn't have its proper ethical end in love of God or love of neighbour. Do your words line up with your works? Does your life express humble dependence upon the Lord? Spurgeon also wrote that there are two certainties about things that shall come to pass. One is that God knows, and the other is that we do not know. Our lives are like vapour. They're transitory, they're impermanent, they lack substance. And it's only as we recognise that our lives are but mist that we're able to humbly depend upon the Lord, knowing that our fragility calls forth his blessing. Humble acceptance of our limitations leads to a right understanding and projection of who we are. Sadly, there are all too many examples we could draw upon of those in Christian ministry who have been leading double lives. Who are you? You are mist, but you're hidden in Christ. You are vapour, and yet the bride of Christ. You vanish, but as the bride of Christ, hidden in him, as he never will, even though we are like mist, we are loved, known, and we will be resurrected individually because of who our triune God is, not because of us. Our words don't shape reality, his do. We do not have the power to form reality with our words. Only God does. A recognition of our mist-like status leads to humble dependence upon the Lord. So let's not just think about humility, let's live it knowing that our weakness and fragility is what draws Christ's goodness towards us. Thanks so much for listening. Shall I pray? Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have made us like mist. We know that we just vanish. But Father, thank you so much that even though our lives as a result of the fall are just so fragile, um, thank you that even through that you've always made us to depend upon you. And so I pray, Father, that you'd give us that humble dependence. Would you expose those areas in our hearts, in our lives, where we seek to have mastery, control, 
where we seek to be independent from you, where we seek to put uh, pretense over reality, where we, we want to deny our mistiness. Please would you show us the dignity that you've given us in Christ as we are united to him. But I pray, Father, that would lead to a humble dependence and not to an arrogant spirit that actually seeks to separate us from you. Please would you show us the way and strengthen us to walk in it so that we may humbly depend upon you all the days of our lives. Know that there will be a day when either Jesus returns or we will be called home to you. Thank you for that resurrection that's ahead of us. And I pray that that eternal focus would enable us to live well today, recognising who we are as we trust in who you are. I just ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.